What is art? Some would say that art is communicating beauty. Some would say that it's an expression of imagination. And some that art is simply a work that has to be appreciated. The United States government agreed that art is something that should be appreciated. So in 1965, President Lyndon B. Johnson formed the National Endowment for the Arts in order to fund artists in their pursuit of making works that have to be appreciated. One such artist that received a grant through the taxpayer-funded National Endowment for the Arts was artist and photographer Andreas Serrano. The National Endowment for the Arts has determined that the people of the United States needed to appreciate Mr. Serrano's art. Mr. Serrano's pictures involve bodily fluid in some way, depicting, for example, blood, sometimes menstrual blood, semen, feces, or human breast milk. He is also known for his erotic photography and he even has a display where he has pictures of corpses. Mr. Serrano was chosen to receive grants totaling $15,000 in 1986 to produce his art for the American people, paid for by the American people. In 1987, he unveiled his masterpiece that the government funded. It was titled, Piss Christ. The photograph shows a Catholic crucifix with Jesus on the cross, submerged in a jar of Mr. Serrano's own urine. In response to the outcry from Christians for the blasphemous photograph, Mr. Serrano had two photographs placed on display at the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, D.C. One photograph titled Heaven and Hell depicts a bound woman covered in blood behind a Catholic cardinal. The American Family Association, a Christian organization, wrote the following to the National Endowment for the Arts, that Mr. Serrano's art is an example of, quote, a deplorable, despicable display of vulgarity. They continued, this matter does not involve freedom of artistic expression. It does involve the question of whether American taxpayers should be forced to support such trash. The reply from the director of the National Endowment for the Arts was, I think that controversy has always been endemic to art. That certainly it's been endemic to 20th century art. Even as far back as Caravaggio, people complained because he painted the Virgin too naturalistically with dirty feet. I think that discussion of obscenity and propriety are endemic to art because art is always on the cutting edge and anything that's on the cutting edge is going to offend someone. So that brings us back to our first question. What is art? Is it simply controversial images or entertainment that pushes social norms? Is it something that comes from human imagination and therefore must be appreciated? What if art is more than the whims of demon-possessed druggies and drunks? What if art is actually cosmic warfare, worship, and glory? The King's Hall podcast exists to make self-ruled men who rule well and win the world. Well, welcome to this episode of the King's Hall podcast. Dan, thank you so much for that very... Yeah, thanks. Very scenic picture of Piss Christ. Hey, you know what? Uh, I would not search his art. It's really bad. Have you looked at it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of it is like erotic when i say that like don't search it yeah don't don't it's do it it sounds quite horrible it's it actually disgusting. reminds me there was a question in there which is a, i think it's a good one to kick us off there was a question what is art and it reminds me of the great philosopher ron swanson who said it's art anything is anything <laughs> i also think it's pointless for a human to paint scenes of nature when they could just go outside and stand in it Anyway, please do not misinterpret the fact that I am talking right now as genuine interest in art and attempt to discuss it with me further. End of speech. <laughs> right, we have this thing in our culture where artists especially, they're just the woo-woo people. Yeah. Like Crystal Rock Feather, I don't know what they're doing. They just get to make stuff up. Those are the artists. You know what it is? Let's just be honest here. It's money laundering. <laughs> it's like, let's be let's be real here. It's, it's Democrat apparatus saying i purchased this modern art it was paint splattered on a canvas for 1.2 million it was it was money laundering get out of here anyway yeah that's for another episode maybe yeah i i (laughs) I was going to go two different routes with our story i went this direction but the other one was the funding of the 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 gays 
Mm-hmm. Like how much money this uh, this National Endowment for the Arts is actually funneling into gay organizations uh-huh. is is pretty incredible. It's difficult to compile though because they don't come out and tell you yeah. straight away how much. By the way, the National Endowment for the Arts, their budget for 2020 was $162 million. Maybe they want to fund the King's Hall. You know, let's write them a letter. Let's <laughs> send them the pitch deck. <laughs> well, we got some ideas now from Mr. Serrano. Was that yeah. Was? Serrano. Yeah. Oh, my word. Serrano. I think you're Serrano. supposed to roll the R's, but I can't. Serrano. And he shouldn't. That's great. Speaking, <laughs> that was Eric, by the way. Speaking of rolling R's, uh, the title of this week's show has no R's in it. <laughs> <laughs> it has R's, yes, it isn't does. it? does. R. No, that's like pirate R's. Art. Okay, so oh, we're talking okay. about Christian media arts. And music, and I think, you know, as we saw in the cold open, there is this fundamental question, what is art, what is media, what is it for? And we want to unpack that in today's show. So today we live in a world that is dominated by technology, and technology has shaped the way that we consume media, including art. With the advent of the smartphone in 2007, that change has rapidly accelerated, and we've all experienced that in just a single generation and lifetime. Similar changes occurred with the advent of radio, TV, and, of course, the internet. You guys remember the uh, AOL.com, the discs? Yeah. yeah I got I 60 minutes. Yeah. I got yep. 60 minutes to go online, mm. dial-up speed. So that I can download oh, Napster. <laughs> yeah. So I can download. Oh, yeah. I was going on Music MySpace, on Napster. actually. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yep. It's way Same. cooler. Is that a MySpace? I didn't yeah, know you were alive then. It's how I flirted with my wife originally. MySpace. 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 Oh, yeah. She was in my top five. I don't know. I was, I was trying to get Facebook. I was trying to get with her. I was like, I'll put her in my top five. <laughs> I'll put her in my top five. I'll put five. some Goo Goo Dolls when you come on, you know, like all the stuff that impresses the junior high girl. Oh, yeah. Goo oh, Goo yeah. Dolls was where it was at. All about don't it. Don't like where this conversation has gone. Speaking of where this conversation <laughs> has gone, according to studies, the average American spends roughly 13 and a half hours per day in exposure to some form of media. 13 and a half hours. Unreal. Like, what, what are you awake for? Like, 16 Six, yeah, about, right about, 16, 17. So, like, are, I don't know where the three hours that where you're not connected are. You're eating dinner while you Instagram. Yeah, you're Instagramming what, your that's dinner. That's what it is. That is unbelievable. Driving? So, I would wager pre-2007. Yeah. Well, listen to a podcast. Pre-2007, right. that number was probably a lot less. Oh, you're, yeah, almost guaranteed. Uh, TV, in the, in the TV days, I remember they would say, you know, the average American watches six hours of TV a day. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, that's more than double. Dang. So in this episode, we want to ask some fundamental questions about media, art, music. Obviously, it's powerful. Yeah. Obviously, people are consuming a lot of it. But we want to ask questions like these, Dan. What exactly is media? What's the point of it? Is it neutral? And then we'll also examine the condition of media today, how it's currently being used, how it shows up in the Christian media space, and what in particular, we'll close by talking about what in particular we can do with strategy. What should we be doing with media as Christians if you take everything that we've talked about, yeah. Boniface and this whole approach to life post-mill, how would it apply to media? So we're going to address that. Yeah. So I want to start with this question. Number one, what is media? What is art? What is the point of it? Well, first of all, media is the pearl, plural of medium. So it's just a plural form of a medium, which is simply a conduit or mechanism for transfer of substance from one person or place to another. So not like a sorcerer. A uh, medium. Well, it's kind of similar. Like you're, you're the <laughs> they're, they're the conduit. They're the conduit. The medium is the canvas yes. upon which the necromancy occurs. So exactly like witchcraft. It actually, Continue. it's interesting. I hadn't yeah. thought about so, that. So yeah, actually, if you work at CNN, you're actually a witch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, probably, but not because of that. <laughs> probably, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So th- this is a uh, media or medium is is how we get things like publication, music, entertainment, TV, books, art. Right, So we have to have media to deliver something. But I think what's often missed is that the medium or the media plural doesn't just pass along raw data or information. In fact, there was a book that went by this title as well. The medium is the message. Mm-hmm. So the way that you deliver it and who's delivering it matters significantly. So one thing we need to be clear about is that media is never ultimately operating in a completely neutral way. Yeah, It is always offering a picture of the good life an understanding of what is good, true, and beautiful, and a way of seeing the world. And this brings us actually to back to the cold open. Modern art shows beautiful things as disfigured. The music will show things like cacophony as desirable, even though it sounds heinous. 
So I want to ask you guys, what are some other ways that media art or music can be used to distort reality, lie, or otherwise be used in an unrighteous way? Yeah, I think it's interesting when you when you understand media as medium, as just a vehicle for communicating ideas. And it's 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 a medium for externalizing your values, externalizing your message, externalizing your goals uh, for society. You're trying to influence people to believe certain things about the good, the true, and the beautiful, and you're trying to promote your message, worldview, your, your, you know, your aims for life, what you think people should be living for via media all the time. And so it really is, I think, first of all, it is essential to, this, to the project of this season of the King's Hall when we're talking about the new Christendom and you know, living, clearing the job site for our cathedral and then putting the stones on top of each other for this Christendom, you, you realize that um, media is going to be an inescapable aspect of this project. And I think even of something as, uh, you know, that we probably don't think of in terms of media, but think about Luther and his 95 theses on the Wittenberg Chapel door. That's media. Yeah. I mean, he was he was communicating a message in a, a way that was possible publicly. You can certainly, be, uh, you know, uh, bank on that if Luther had other tools available to him like we do today, he would have communicated his ideas via those mediums. And so, you know, the first thing I think that we have to get is that it what you said, it's not neutral. And uh, Christians have to get that kind of from the gate out there because they we tend to operate oftentimes as if it is and it, as if most media is just yeah it's fine it's entertainment it's just you know i watch this sitcom it's just i i you know helps me relax in the evening hang out with my family but no the person who made that sitcom however disconnected it may seem from religious ideology they're trying to disciple you well and that it really gets to the power of media i've heard people say this you probably have as well uh, there's no Obergfell without will and grace. Exactly. Meaning, there, there's not the overturning of you know the gay mirage, mm-hmm. anti-gay mirage uh, laws, unless you have a TV show that is selling, look how cool and look how winsome and look how wonderful being a homosexual is in today's culture. And you can go back to the Reformation, Dan, as well, and you look at you know the press, the modern printing press. Yeah, the printing press. That's really what helped fuel a lot of the Reformation. Well, yeah, because there were other reformers that came before Luther. Right, but 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 it, the lack of ability to get that message out. Right, yeah. In mm-hmm. spite, yeah. Uh, so Luther, it wasn't like a intention of his to start printing his sermons and things like that. People just did. did they it. transcribed. Trans, actually, the ninety five thesis yeah. was supposed to be just like an intramural sort of debate. Yeah, exactly. And it ended up being translated from Latin into German and printed, and and eventually got Distributed. the attention of the Pope. And it and it took a good two hundred years or so. Um, for the Gutenberg Press to proliferate print materials. I mean, it wasn't like Gutenberg Press and then overnight print materials were everywhere. It really took actually, in that time, a few centuries before it was widely practiced that you would have print materials like this. So you see the way, though, that as as that proliferated through through Europe and across the world, that all of a sudden the the pace of discourse changed and was influenced by the medium. So you see that actually as we're approaching this subject as well, it's really important that Christians understand that the medium itself is going to shape the way the message is communicated. So I know this is really off base, but in the same way that things changed with those booklets and sermons being printed and the hierarchy at the time didn't know how to respond to it adequately. You know, they're just like, Mm -hmm. well, we'll ban it. Or if you're caught with it, we'll punish you or whatever. And so they're trying to condemn it like that. In the same way, we see that that change uh, of medium throughout history, even to today. People don't know what to do with memes. Like yeah, meme communication. People, I mean, older older folks are really confused at what in the world you're supposed to do with memes. Yeah, you know, they argue in a with them. way. So, well, did you see Thomas Acord's tweet about that? I did. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah, re- I want to read it. It was okay. so good. Okay, he's explaining meme warfare in this tweet. And, uh, you know, this, he says, rule number one of meme warfare, don't argue against memes. They're rhetorical, not factual weapons. If you argue, you lose. Rule number two of meme warfare, 
don't become angry at memes against you or your position. If you are, react emotionally, you lose. Rule number three of meme warfare, laughter wins. Like, here's so an example true. of, you know, you send a meme to, like, you know, my parents' generation, and they, they might think that they're supposed to, you know, provide a, a, a an essay response arguing back, and it's, like, actually... A sternly written letter. Yes, yeah, sternly written letter. And in in the, 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 the media, in the medium of memery, that that's actually doesn't work. In fact, your opponents, the people they memeing at you, at you, they won't even read it. They'll make another meme where you're in the midwit middle with your really long dissertation, and then you know they'll put the dumb guy in the in the sage on the other side of the bell curve. They'll just make the bell curve meme back at you, and then you'll write another one. Like you have to you have to understand that the medium is actually going to influence and affect how the message gets out. Well, and I think ultimately, and we'll get into this in the strategy section, but. Mm-hmm. As Christians, we ought to be masters of these, I would argue, of these media, of these medium. We ought to be able to know how to use it and use it righteously. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're fighting in a meme war, then then know how to use that medium. The, the other thing I want to ask, though, is, is we look at media. It can be used for tremendous good or tremendous evil. It just so happens in America that you have leftist, progressive, Marxist uh, gatekeepers of institutions like the New York Times— yeah, people like this who are using it yeah. sort of as the propaganda arm of the state, and it's really horrible. Mm-hmm. One example of this, uh, and this was this week, Roy Moore, uh, you remember Judge Roy Moore, he defended in Alabama, he got kicked off the Supreme Court for defending the Ten Commandments and their usage in the courts in Alabama. He refused to rescind them. He actually argued that he was acting as a lesser magistrate. Uh, he was removed, stays in politics, writes some books, runs for Senate a few years ago, I think 2017. Uh, one of the political packs in Alabama runs an ad. So here we're talking about media. Mm-hmm. They run an ad saying that, yeah, he's such a sexual predator that this mall down the street wouldn't even let him come on the premises because he was such a child predator. Well, the only problem with it was it was 100% fabricated. Wow. I didn't know that. Yep. Completely fabricated. It came out this week that it was a complete fabrication. I think it was Mitch McConnell and their pack money. Uh, that ran the hit piece mm-hmm. on him. Of course, he he loses the election. He was winning in Alabama. Mm-hmm. He ends up losing the election and is basically, you know, forced out of politics yeah. at that point. So what was interesting about this is people also in another media form on Twitter, people like Al Mohler jumped on the bandwagon and said, yeah, look at this guy. We can't support him. They said, look, he's guilty by accusation. Mm. We see the Me Too movement probably can't happen without Twitter. Yeah, or similar mediums, yeah. Yeah, without the quick react social media. So, again, this week uh, he won an $8 million lawsuit Wow! against these people. They don't care because they got their candidate in and they're worth hundreds of millions. But here's my point. Media can be used for bad and for good. Yeah. So as Christians, and I want to ask this, like how should we be thinking about media and its usage and the power that it has. I mean, we've seen in King's Hall, correct me if I'm wrong, you're able to multiply your message pretty exponentially through yeah. now really what we're talking about, mass communications. Yeah. For the project of this season to be successful, the project of seeing a new Christendom built, there will need to be thousands and thousands of Christian men and women who are equipped to stand for the truth of Scripture against the errors of both the liberal church and the pagan culture. This is one reason we're so glad to be partnering with our sponsor for this season, Reformation Heritage Books. Reformation Heritage Books offers a large selection of helpful and theologically rigorous resources on everything from biblical theology to history to blue-collar family discipleship, the type of library and resources that could make the kind of men and women I just described grounded in the rich heritage of the Reformed faith. We'd like to highlight one resource in particular, their Family Worship Bible Guide, that presents rich devotional thoughts on all 1,189 chapters of the Bible, including searching questions to promote conversation and to help you in leading your family in such a way as to say with Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Tap the link in the description of this episode to pick one up today. One one thing that's interesting, you know, as a thought exercise, and, and people can get this wrong sometimes, They'll 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 go down lines of reasoning like this. They'll say like, why don't pastors? Why would a pastor spend ten or fifteen hours a week, sometimes more, 
you know, depending on their skill level or what kind of sermons they're preaching, writing a sermon or doing something like that. When they could be meeting with people, you know, how many people could you meet within 15 hours in the week? Yeah, a sermon is really a form of mass communication. Right, and it sounds plausible at first. You're like, yeah, that does seem like a bad use of time. But then think, let's say that you're preaching at a church with 100 people and you preach an hour-long sermon. Well, you've just done 100 hours of communication. You know, you just talk to... 100 people. Let's say you do a podcast and you get a thousand people to listen to your hour long thing. Well, that's a thousand hours of communication that you've just distributed. Let's say that you get a YouTube channel that, you know, like I think of something, uh, take Apologia, you know, they, they, they were like the one of the original YouTube sensation kind of Christian media, um, media enterprises that really hit it big on YouTube. One of their, they use all those clickbaity titles, which is pretty funny, but they're like, the met, the the mess, the youth message that shocked everybody. Listen to the end. And literally no one is It shocked. has like 4 million listens and it's like an hour long. It's 4 million watch hours or something like that on something that Pastor Jeff Durbin preached once. Yeah. So when you, when you look at media, one of the things you have to understand is that definitionally media can function as a force multiplier. Because of that phenomena, that that math equation, where you paint a, a you a painting, or you put together a play, or you compose a piece of music, or you make a building, or you all of these different things that communicate different aspects of your fundamental system of belief, and everybody that interacts with that piece of of art or media is in conversation with you, and so every. Every person who's walked into the Sistine Chapel has been in conversation with all of the artists who made the frescoes and the architects and the builders. They've been in conversation just looking and interacting with that object in a way that is powerfully force multiplying. So, so I think it's important, first of all, that Christians don't too quickly dismiss media, arts, and even things like entertainment as offhand, mainly a waste of time. Well, and I, I think I, you're absolutely right. And I think the reason that they tend to do this, Jordan Peterson has even talked about this. Mm-hmm. As they stand right now, media, theater, music, mm-hmm. anything creative tends to attract people from the left. Yeah. So you can look at Hollywood and spaces like this. They're just dominated by the left. Mm-hmm. And we'll unpack this a little more. Conservatives are like, I'm going to go start a political think tank and I'm we're going to think we're going to crunch the numbers and we're going to show people the data on inflation and that's right. going to change hearts and minds. We're going to write political articles. But my argument would be it doesn't have to be that way. Right. C- conservatives and Christians in particular here, we could actually be great storytellers. Absolutely. In fact, we should be. The greatest stories, I, I think that, for example, the greatest work of fiction in the English language in the 20th century is the Lord of the Rings. And I think I can say that without any qualification. I actually don't know. That's my opinion. But you think I of, would like to hear a contender. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, honestly, I can't, I can't think I've of actually it. tried to think of Because when English. you told me that, I was like, nah, nah. But then Wait you think. Minute, I, I can't think of anything. And, and, uh, in 20th century, English speaking, like yeah. there, there's some asterisks. Yeah, maybe like Twilight. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, Ray, 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 Ray make some kind of retching noise in there or something. <laughs> Give us some sound effects that dunks on Eric for me. But, but you look at you look at something like that, and you begin to understand that one of the the mistakes the in, the mistakes is endemic to conservatism, and often to you know by therefore Christianity because Christians tend to be conservatives, is that we fail to recognize the sheer power of media and storytelling and things that seem to not be doing anything other than frivolous things, but they're actually powerfully at work shaping your conception of what the world is like and ought to be like. And if if you understand that, then you will immediately conclude that we should have, and the world should be awash with Christians making sitcoms and movies and documentaries and paintings and doing them and well. music and doing them fantastic it shouldn't just be pagans who are spending 200 million dollars to to make a movie christians should be doing that too and i and i don't mean just movies that are ham-fistedly designed to give the gospel message like a sneaky backdoor sort of fireproof or, yeah, yeah it's yeah. almost like if you if you trust in jesus your team will win all the state championships <laughs> yeah and the football team will 
No, we need it we all need, gets better. Yeah, we need Christians making films that portray the beauty of love and romantic love in the natural family, and fatherhood and motherhood, and you know we need we need these kinds of in art and and it's it's I was hugely encouraged. You had the, you know the other day I was at Grace Agenda uh, up in Moscow, Idaho, and Jess Hall, the CEO of Canon Press, was sort of sketching out their their vision for the future of their their company. And one of the things that he mentioned that they are working on is actually making sitcoms. And I was like, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant because, you know, think of how many people have had their ideas of marriage and family shaped by Saved by the Bell and full, you know, I'm, I haven't actually watched a sitcom in probably 10 Modern years. Modern Family is a big one. There you go. What, what are some of the ones all the well, middle-aged even, ladies are watching? Even from Modern the, Family? The 50s. I don't know, you seem like The Office and, oh, yeah, and yeah, the, Parks and Rec. And, look how The Office and Parks and Rec has shaped the way that people talk and joke with each other. Or even, I was even thinking like, it's derogatory now, but you look back and you think of like from the 50s, Leave it to Beaver. We still talk about that. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is interesting because people are always dunking on it. And I'm like, honestly, that would be more ideal than what we have now. It, even if you think about something, sometimes we neglect that architecture is a, is a wing of this kind of conception, but architecture communicates things. You know, I remember a story about some large Christian speaker was talking about a building that was being made by these sort of postmodernist architectures, architectures, architects. And they were trying to communicate with the building what they believed about the world. So they were trying to upend the idea of objective truth and reality and morality and all these things that, that reality is infinitely malleable to whatever you believe. They were trying to communicate this. And so the building was like all misshapen and it looked impossible. And, you know, you get staircases to nowhere and all kinds of stupid stuff like that. And what's really funny is, you know, they make this building and they think it's communicating their worldview and on on a level it is but on the deepest level they cannot help but communicate the christian faith because guess what the engineers who designed the building and and the inspectors who signed off on it they still had to do math that god wrote <laughs> or the building would fall over yeah that's that's incredible i always think of babel as an mm -hmm. illustration yeah. of this that our our worship is going to be reflected in the things we build mm -hmm. And so in all of this discussion, it, it's the old uh, Van Til, right, that culture is religion externalized. Yeah, Henry Van Til. We could say the same thing about media. We could say mm -hmm. the same thing about art. Whatever you create yeah. uh, by way of media and art is going to be a reflection of what you ultimately worship. Yeah, culture is the, the artifacts of a people. So before, Brian, I, you're absolutely right. Before we dive into what's the status of American media today mm -hmm. and, and what does it reveal about what we worship, I want to ask... A primary question. What would be the proper use of media? What? Why is art, story, et cetera, why is it so important that we get this right? What is it for? Right. What's the telos of media and art? So one of the things that before you jump to, it's tempting and there are ways in which we need to talk about the actual purposes, things we're trying to accomplish with media. But even prior to that, I think one of the first things we have to say about media is that it says something about anthropology. It says something about what a human being is in distinction from other created beings, right? It says something that about man's status as an image bearer that he goes out and he wherever man goes, he adorns everything mm. in a way that, you know, dolphins don't do that. Even even really highly intelligent animals compared to other animals, they don't create oil paintings. They don't create beautiful works of architecture. Or even Abraham, as he's going through the promised land before he's inherited it, of course, everywhere he goes, he builds an altar. Yeah. So he's doing construction projects. Everywhere God has answered and showed up in his life, he, he builds an yeah. altar. And so when you look at, Human beings going out and the, it's inescapable. Human beings just go out and they create. They they make beauty. They make art. They make media. They make stories. They make songs. They make plays across the world. Whether you're a Native Americans three thousand years ago, Aboriginal peoples in Australia, you know, early Germanic peoples, Romans, Greeks, Africans, every distinct human art. distinct. They will put art on walls. They will scratch in stones. They will crush up different animals and make them into different colored stuff. What does that say? Well, that right there says that human beings are created in the image of God 
and they're sub creators where God is this capital C creator, human beings go out and they reflect God's image, his likeness by telling stories and, and, and doing all those. And, and now we need to take those instincts that human beings have by virtue of their, their created ontology, their nature. And we then need to turn them towards the ends for which God created the world. You know, that's where things go wrong is when sin gets into the system, human beings don't stop being sub creators. They don't stop being artists and, you know, storytellers and songwriters. They just turn and they make piss Christ or they make these blasphemous and evil or truly frivolous and well, yeah, uh, they was, communicate. Even in the journalism world, I'd say, you know, equivalent to piss Christ would be MSNBC, New York Times, you name it. They're essentially doing the same thing with words. So, Dan, I want to ask you, if you were to take Brian's principles, and this is your job on a daily basis, right? You take Brian's principles and you break it down for the blue collar man. What does that say? Like if we're, if we're these sub creators, is that what you called them, Brian? Yeah, that's right. If you're a sub creator, how does that, how does that play out for say, say you're a journalist, say you're working in a local newspaper or you're working for the federalist or whoever, how does being a sub creator shape your vocation? Yeah, that's a good question. And so when I think about this and <clears throat> Precision is important here with some of the things that I'm going to say, mm -hmm. because I'm having to navigate like certain Gnostic ideas, like we're a spark of the divine or some yeah. such, such nonsense. So when I say that we're, uh, you, what, what was the term you used? We're not recreating. We're sub-creating. We sub-creating. It's almost as if we are reorganizing and, and, and creating back something and that something should communicate to people the glory of God. Yeah. And so as man is the glory of God, as we work and, uh, you know, as a journalist or as an artist or an architect, what we are doing is it communicating back fundamental truths that God built into the universe of what is good, true, and beautiful that can only be right ordered under those who are spiritually alive, yeah. who are given the Holy Spirit, who are in right order with God because those who are not blood-bought, uh, regenerate, being renewed in their mind are actually disordered. There's something fundamentally wrong with the unbeliever, with the pagan mind. There's a disorder in their mind and in their creation that would prevent them from fully creating something or communicating something adequately to glorify God, to glorify the creator. That's why in the, in the story I said, what if art is actually cosmic warfare, worship, and glory, not just like it is warfare, worship, and glory, but at, on like a cosmic level, like peeking behind the scenes to where you have the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light are actually at war. And it's, it's, it's coming out in mediums. It's coming out on computer screens and in tweets and on newspapers and uh, through your ears and on the TV set. There's actually a cosmic war going on behind the scenes. And so our responsibility as Christians, as blood-bought people, are to fight that war. And the way that you fight that is through, in a lot of ways, culture, which is worship, externalized. And so when you're making things, you should be making them to the glory of God. And that does multiple things. You know, it glorifies God, not in just some, like, pietistic, warm, fuzzy feelings, but actually in, like, fighting back the kingdom of darkness. So when someone makes an absolutely beautiful oil painting or tells an amazing story, what you're doing is you're communicating back the true, the good, and the beautiful that God has already put into the hearts of, of redeemed men and communicated naturally in the yeah. universe. So when you look at a mountain sunset, you know, and, and then you paint that and you, I mean, it, it transcends, you know, your, your current moment in your drab home and you look at that painting what it's doing is it's telling you a truth. Mm -hmm. It's telling you something. Whereas something like the the art that the gentleman at the beginning of this episode did is it's actually fundamentally lying to you. Mm -hmm. It's telling you lies. And so I lost your question somewhere in my ramblings. Yeah. But I, I think fundamentally that's what you're talking about with sub creation yeah. is in a way you're creating back glory that God has revealed. Yeah. Like, I think it was really interesting, Dan, because I asked for a blue-collar answer, and I got a Brian answer. Yeah, you got more. Which is, 
It's very interesting. Uh, let me multiply some more of that in that same vein. Because we're going to get blue collar. We're going to get blue collar. Yeah. We absolutely are. But built on the, the, the foundational theoretical understanding and principle that is important to stand under your feet. Before you go do anything, you have to understand like what you're standing on, what you're aiming for. And I'm realizing now that that term sub-creator I actually got, I think it's Lightheart, Peter Lightheart. Uh, he, t- he, he spoke of a sub-creator being a created being that also creates. Because we're created in the image of God, humans are therefore created to be sub-creators. That's from his commentary on First and Second Kings. Mm. But w- what does that mean? Well, it means that whenever you go out into the world and you adorn something or you take raw materials and you put it together in a way that's supposed to be pleasing or communicate beauty or tell a story or any, any kind of artistic media sort of enterprise, what you're always doing and what a Christian should, well, let me start here. What you're always doing is you're, te- you're, you're speaking and communicating something either about how the world is, the, how the world is, how it ought to be, what's wrong with it, or what you think it ought to be. Right, like, and I'm sure there's more you could say, but those are some of the big categories that art is almost always doing, which is why it's so powerful, either in towards glory or towards perdition, when human beings go and do this artistic endeavor. Think about what what's a, really good with like sitcoms that you talk about. Yeah, is that you're saying the world ought to be like the Modern Family, where there's like the quirky gay people and there's yeah. like the the immodest daughter that's always in dating issues and yeah, there's. You're, the dopey husband. You're saying this is what the world is like and should be. Or, you know, even think about in the sitcom, a lot of the time you always have like the the token gay couple and they're always this faithful, basically everything true about the natural family, but just with a gay couple. And it's communicating that idea that, yeah, gay men, when they go and get married, it's just like a man and a woman leaving his, you know, man leaving his father and mother and holding fast to his wife as it always has been. They're just making a house. They just happen to be two men. Instead of if Christians were to tell the story of true reality and actually expose what the gay, especially the male homosexual community is actually like, it would be all bathroom meetings and multiple partners and monkeypox. The number of people that got monkeypox, according to the surveys, I think that it had had more than 20 sexual partners in the last like 60 days or 90. It was huge. So if a Christian went out, uh, again, when Christians do art, it shouldn't just be this, let's just tell this beautiful story, let's just show kind of this, kind of the, you know, everything sanitized. Christians should have no problem, provided that we do it in a way that is appropriate and not sinful, of portraying even the depths of reality. And I, I think about the biblical narrative. We're chopping up concubines, and we have all of the men from the oldest to the youngest of Sodom coming out trying to rape these angels, these male angels. And, you know, the what? scriptures are fully open about the depths of depravity in human beings, too. I think it's one of the things I've actually appreciated. I know there are people who think I'm, I'm pretty normie for saying this, but Focus on the Family Forever has put out Plugged In Online, which mm. is their evaluation of movies. And yeah. they're actually yeah. usually pretty helpful. They're helpful. But one of the things I know Bob Smithhauser has said for a long time is, the thing that you're particularly on guard for as a movie critic is when they're trying to make sin seem good. Right. And they're trying to make good things seem bad. Right. So Light a lot art. of times, like, if you watch a film or you watch a movie and it's, like, promiscuity, but it it's like, oh, it's happy and it's joyful. It's happy promiscuity. Now, there is a way to rightly show it where it's, like, promiscuity leads to misery and death. Right. Um, as does, you know, Proverbs is pretty explicit about where adultery leads as well. So I think that's part of the question. Uh, getting back to my original question, Dan, which was about journalists. What? You know, how should a journalist That's be? what your question was, yeah. journalist? Yeah, exactly. And I was waxing poetic about exactly. mountain paintings. Exactly. What a, <laughs> You're what talking nerd. about, uh, you know, Bob Ross, and I'm talking about, like, what should a journalist do? And, th- and that's my world, right? As a trained journalist, that's what I'm thinking about. So here's what I would say to that question, to my own question. I think a lot of it is, it, it's, it's a lot of the same answer. Look, we want to present reality as it is. That is yeah. honoring God. The things that are good, true, and beautiful, we want to give them airtime. And the things that aren't, we want to show them as heinous and disgusting because right. that's what they are. Exactly. So we, in conservative journalism, we've often talked about this issue of like, should I use all the pronouns? Should I talk about things in the way that the left wants the narrative to be driven? Mm. You know, my answer to those questions is, is no. Yep. But I think there's also been an, an inherent problem with journalism. When I was in journalism school and college, one thing we were told is, Listen, as a journalist, your job is to be neutral 
and to be completely objective. <laughs> and what we've realized through the years is even people who think they're objective aren't. And finally, in, in more recent times, I had a, a boss say to me, he said, listen, we all have presuppositions. Yeah. It would be better if we just came to the table and said, this is where I'm coming from, and this is what I think is right, true, good, beautiful, whatever. Yeah. And that's how I'm going to report. So this is a story uh, from the book Essentialism. But the late writer Nora Ephron, who was a journalist, also famous for movies like Sleepless in Seattle and When Harry Met Sally, she, two of Brian's favorites, by the yeah, way. Yeah, two of Brian's favorites. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Top yes. five for sure. Yeah, for sure. Twilight's up there. Top five. Uh, she talks about the story in which she had a poignant lesson from one of her journalism professors. And she said it made her realize. I realized that jur journalism was not just about regurgitating facts, but about figuring out the point. It wasn't enough to know the who, what, when, where. You had to understand what it meant and why it mattered. And so my argument from that quote would be, you have to have a Christian worldview. Yeah. You have to understand the narrative that Christ and, and the glory of God's redemptive history is pointing at. Well, absolutely. Look, how could you tell a story that does any of the things we've just said arts and media are supposed to do, which is to say what reality is like. What's the point? To notice what is true about the world that God made. To point out a way that it's gone wrong and yeah. how to fix that. Right? How to tell any of these good stories. How can you do that if you don't actually understand the 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 actual foundational uh, reality of reality? Think think about think about how much of the world is just did God create just to yell about death, burial, and resurrection? Yeah, like how much nature, human relationships, human Farming. history, all of these things. God God brought together ten million strands of stories to tell that story of death, burial, and resurrection. Mm. It, it reminds me of, I think it's in Notes from a tilt world where Andy Wilson is talking about God's exhaustive knowledge of all things. And one of the things that he points out is that God knows, it might have been death by living, God knows the story, the epic story of every ant that has ever lived, right? Like there are, there are epic journeys that a, that a carpenter ant has gone on to save his colony or to, you know, and God knows every single one of them. And, and most of the stories that he's written into re reality, he's the only one who will know them. Mm. They were just there because he is an interesting and interested God, right? It, the story of every butterfly that ever dies and then is reborn, you know, every caterpillar that's ever dies and reborn. God is telling that story 10 million times over every year. And he notices every one of them. Right, like the story of God knows the story of how every uh, cubic centimeter of Earth, which Earth that can grow things, rich, fertile soil, cannot exist without the death and burial and composting of billions of organisms. If you factor in like, even bacteria and fungi and all these things that God worked into the soil cycle, so that crops could grow and trees could grow, and we look at it and we're like dirt and bugs, and and God is, He says. I'm telling the story of all things of death, burial, resurrection, and glory in over and over and over. God doesn't get tired of this story. How could you tell a true or beautiful story about anything without knowing that that is what reality is pointed at? And what that means is that if you do tell such a story, it's because you with maybe even without knowing it, you stole from the Christian story. Think about, you know, even, yeah filmmakers or authors who have tried to intentionally subvert that like uh what's, what's his the, name no country for old men Cormac oh, McCarthy, Cormac McCarthy. Cormac McCarthy yeah. you know try to tell nihilistic sort of stories even those you you walk away with a deep sense of wrongness which is a the feature of christian yeah, reality well that's the target he's trying, he's trying to, to hit, hit too yeah yeah is actually trying to grade against this instinctual yeah idea of of what is right and what mm -hmm. is wrong yeah you're right and all it does is end up saying wow that's wrong that's and not also, how it ought to be no you see that in like the troubled hero yeah. that's so popular today with superheroes the anti-hero like, and troubled yeah, hero. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly yeah and dumbledore stories, has to be gay and he has to be all these whatever well <laughs> i think that actually in reading cormac mccarthy i always thought i think that's part of his war on grammar as well Oh, yeah. It's a war against the structures of Western culture. Of objectivity. I mean, I'm a fan because I actually don't know grammar <laughs> at all. It, it, I mean, it drives me nuts. It's weird how... 
Like, like I would rather Pride just and, not use a period ever. You, you read Jane Austen <laughs> and then you read Cormac McCarthy and it's like, yeah, no, I choose Jane Austen every time. I just, I actually just re, re listened to Pride and Prejudice on the way back to and that's back like from Grace double digits Jenna. in the last two years. Yeah, for him. yeah dude. I'm just it. saying. Just saying. So, so we've argued that media is important. We've argued mm -hmm. that the people delivering media are important. Their hearts and minds, yeah. right? The journalists. Uh, now I want to ask you a, a simple question, but it can have a variety of answers. What's the status of media, mainstream media, but all media in America today? When you look about, what do you see? Mm. Pop. Popular culture. Yeah. I mean, pop culture. So the music, the books, the music. Twaddle. I said music already. Movies is what yeah. I meant. Yeah. TV. All of it is going to be very aged very quickly. And I, and I can say that with confidence because my wife and I like to sometimes take a trip back in time. Uh, she has like an Instagram lady she follows. It's like relive your college days or something like that, which isn't that long ago. It was like 10 years ago and plays the music and has like oh, yeah. the clothing style going out to the club because You're like, wow, this is that horrible. Was the, that was the, <laughs> anyway, I won't talk about that. Yeah. All of it's terrible. Boots You're like, like the fur. Yep. All of that. Her. Brian, Brian was in elementary school. I don't know how he knows that song. Because they played it at the school dance. It was so much at school. Right. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so just looking at a very, very short period of time backwards mm -hmm. in history, you can see that all of this ages yeah. very, very quickly. What is the difference then? This, this is, I think, a fascinating subject that we probably don't have time for. What is the difference between a song or a movie or a story. Story is probably the easiest one to use in as an example, but music is also really good. What is the difference between a song that is aged in five years versus a, a song that's been around for 500 years? Or why is Shakespeare still around when movies, you, you see it once and you're like, oh, gross. I hope I never see that again. Or like, you know, the big box office hit is is not going to be seen in, in 20 years. Nobody's going to be yeah. interested. What well, is the difference between them? Yeah, I'm going to tie my answer together to, to something. I was recently rereading uh, Pat Buchanan's book, The Death of the West. Mm -hmm. That book always fascinates me because it was just as poignant, just as true in 2002 as it is today. Like, if you read that book today, there's not one single thing about it that's like, oh, yeah, I, I forgot things were like that. Yeah. You would think he was writing about right now. Mm -hmm. And I think part of his answer is an answer to your question as well that, Really what's going on with media is an extension of the Marxist leftist state and regime. Okay, so they what they well, this did this got serious real quick. Yeah. What they Boom. did is they captured the institutions. <laughs> yeah. Uh Herbert Marcuse and the the long march through the institutions. That was all critical theory, by the way, who was seeking to do that. Well, here we are now, where that stuff is in every sphere. They're teaching critical race theory to kids, social emotional learning. Media has been completely in media institutions have been completely hijacked by the Marxist left. So now you go on Netflix, which could be a really powerful platform for good things. Mm -hmm. And what do you see? You see like grooming little children. Groomers, all of yeah. them. Yeah, everybody's a groomer. So what I want to say is that would be my assessment of media today right now is it's part of the propaganda machine for the status left. And, and, and because that's true, it means that it will not tell stories that have staying power. Because it's trying to, to tell an anti-reality story. Well, they're lies. It's trying to tell a story that puts forward as true what is not true, right? So when you look at what makes something like, again, Pride and Prejudice or Shakespeare are actually two really good examples from completely disparate times that are enduring stories. Or even to come to a modern place, something like Shawshank Redemption, Great. Which is a phenomenal film. Stephen King, right? Yeah, Stephen King. Actually, Stephen Stephen King's books in general, he, he tends to do this well, even though he has a lot of smut and isn't a Christian and is in some ways telling an untruth about reality. But what <laughs> with is all it, those With all those qualifiers. <laughs> but yet he can't help sometimes but tell a good story because he's stealing from the Christian world. But what makes those great? What makes Austin and Shakespeare great? What makes Shawshank Redemption great? Well, one through line is that they all notice and present these archetypal human beings that we all know exist and they unveil them in a way that helps you understand the world you live in and people you know today because they're like Mr. Darcy or they're like Elizabeth or they're like, you know, Othello or they're like these characters in these stories 
these people are often good artists are often astute observers of reality and human nature. Mm, like and a good comedian. The foibles and the virtues. Yeah, like a good comedian. Same, a, a great example, because totally different medium. But what makes good comedy is what makes good fiction, is what makes good documentary stories. They notice things. They notice they're good observers of reality, and they're interested in the world God made. And so they begin to notice these common character flaws, and then they sort of put them under a magnifying glass in a character like... Uh, the the pastor in Pride and Prejudice, or you know, Mr. Mr. Collins, Mr. Collins yeah. or Mr. Darcy, who's proud and arrogant and sins like a man sins, or Elizabeth, who gossips and sins like a woman sins, or her foolish younger sister Mary, who you know, all who You're telling truths because people are Kitty actually or, yeah. like that. Yes, and so you look at those characters and you say, I know these people because they're obstu- but now if you tell the story of a of a faithful gay couple, you don't know that person. Because they're very, they hardly they, ever exist. They literally they're telling exist. an untruth or a benevolent state, as communist propaganda tells. They, they don't really exist. Christendom Bible College offers a one-year certificate in the humanities for students who intend to pursue a degree, or for students who prefer to begin their chosen occupations upon completion of our program. Older students who never attended college or who went to a college where the humanities were less robust will also find our program stimulating and suitable. Located steps from the Ohio River in the town of New Richmond, we're unaccredited in order to remain free to teach as our biblically-minded consciences demand. As servants of Christ, we won't wear the yoke of the woke. Instead, we stand on the shoulders of Christianity's giants, not to stew in nostalgia, but to see through the culture wars fall to the glorious days of a Christendom still to be built. Our exceptional faculty are committed to the historic, biblical foundations of our faith. Come be a part of Christendom Bible College. Visit us on the web at christendombiblecollege.org to learn more. While there, be sure to sign up for our email updates and receive your free three-chapter excerpt of our very own Dr. Frank J. Smith's new book, Race, Church, and Society. It's interesting. I, I have to throw this in there because we're talking about Pride and Prejudice. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did, for the Hard Man podcast, we did the best books. Yeah. My wife listened to all of it. Mm-hmm. And then she goes, I'm disgusted. Ah, why? And I said, Jerry, why are you disgusted? And she goes, you could not remember the name of Lady Catherine de Berg? De Berg. <laughs> And ah. I was like, I know we were on meat Such cabades. a good character, Lady Catherine Such de Berg. A, Such a good character. Judy Dench. She just shows the, like... And actually, another thing that makes Shakespeare and and Austin and and authors from earlier times so great for us to read now is because we're so uh, we're so uh, steeped in a culture awash with lies about human nature. Yeah, that you go back and you're like, no, that really is how women tend to sin. Because she, you know, both of those Shakespeare and Austin portray female gossip this all is, over the place. This is a little off off subject, yeah. but one of the things that I am absolutely amazed at with Shakespeare is that he was actually like pop. Yeah. Like playwright. He would tie into the zeitgeist of the time. Mm-hmm. He would see like certain things going on with the monarchy. And then he's like, I'm going to tell a story. And then he would write a story for the time. Yeah. Th- that time specific time, what's yeah. going on at that time where he is. And we still read it today. And so you, yeah. like you're saying, it transcends just a moment yeah. because you're actually getting a peek behind the scenes of what are humans like? What is the truth? You know, and, and Christians, because Christians have this key, it's like we're looking at a map and Christians have the key. We can look at the symbols in the world. It's like our cheat code. Yeah. The archetypes, the, the typology that God's built into the world, even in human society. And we can see what's happening. We can see sin and folly or wisdom and glory, and we can name them and describe them accurately because we're Christians and we we understand the God who made them all. So this is one of the reasons why historically Christians have made some of the most enduring and greatest stories of all time. Christians have been the ones who have done that. And so one of, one of the things that we need to recover is... Uh, a, a storytelling, a, a, a culture of art and music and beauty and architecture that tells the truth about the world in its in its glory and its inglory. Not like a varnished Christian yeah, version. Yeah, not a like Christian Sunday plastic school. version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Jesus junk, testaments and whatnot at Lifeway. Yeah. Well, speaking you know, of which. Wall hangings. Yeah, go ahead. Speaking of which, 
this brings me to the next subsection that we're talking about. Oh, are we going to talk about Christian media? We're going to talk about Christian oh. media. So, so one of the reasons, if I was playing devil's advocate, one of the problems is we're like, okay, everything you guys say about Christendom sounds great. And when you describe art or you read, uh, you know, Angels in the Architecture or you read Francis Schaeffer on art or any number of books like this, you think, wow, that's a grand vision. Yeah. Well, speaking of grand visions, let's take a look at what Christian media is producing today. Go to your... <sighs> Annual Christian Broadcasters Association. Do we have to? Go to the Christian apps in the app bookstore. And what's crazy about this is where I'm going to ask you a question here. Okay. I promise it's not raining forever. Okay. But Christians are actually aren't without resources and capital when it comes to media. Right. There's actually a lot of money wrapped up in Christendom. The problem is, and I'm just going to be blunt on this one, the stuff that we produce is absolute garbage. Well, it's... Uh, I'm Continue. Yeah, so <laughs> when I was growing up, uh, my parents, every now and then, would take me to church, you know, once biannually, every mm -hmm. two years or something. I'd go to church, and my friends, when we'd go there, they would say, hey, you know, here's the really cool Christian thing. And I was like, oh, what is it? And they're like, watch Facing the Giants. <laughs> and as a non-believer, I was like, this is the cheesiest, gayest thing in the world. And now, and I thought there was something wrong with me, and then I became a Christian, and I watched it again, and I was like, I appreciate what the Kendrick brothers were trying to do but it becomes this ham-fisted, like, my life sucks, then I get Christ, and now I win state championships and my barren wife has babies. And then I go live life in the world and I say, yeah, but that's not the way it is. That's not a representation of reality. It's, yeah. it's cheesy. It's ham-fisted. It's not something that goes, that makes me say internally, wow, the glory and the power of that story. <laughs> yeah, so I was just going to say, the reason that Christian media and entertainment has sucked is because that's what it can make. It's a reflection of the culture. It's a reflection of the people. What's well, a reflection of how cheesy, shallow, and lame Christian culture is? That's exactly my point. Mm. If you distilled it down into a, a big, a fast, drink, and famous produces and sip, that. Yeah, you you distilled it down the culture down in into a glass, and you took a sip of it. That's what it would be. It would be cheese flavored garbage. Well, and and yeah, and so ahead. you see that in other other cultures though. As you look at like the the modern art, yeah. like I read about, you get piss Christ and you get like semen blood, Gross. human breast milk. I'm photographs. sorry that you guys have to listen to this. But this well, is true. I mean, no, this that's is what they're doing. That's what it is. That's what the, yeah. that's what demons produce. Yeah. Piss Christ. They, yeah, they that's what they produce. It, yeah. And then slightly better. And so they behind. get together and they have their fine wines and they look at the art gallery of half naked women covered in blood Ugh. uh with catholic priests and all of these disgusting images and and that's the culture that they have they have yeah. a culture of death they have a culture of sexual immorality they have a culture of demons and so that's what they're going to produce is a culture of demons and they keep trying to shove it down your throat even looking at like the new lord of the rings deal on amazon Ugh. even though people hate it they know they're going to watch it i'm not they're like, yeah, I'm right. going to shove it down your throat anyway. Even yeah. if you don't like it and you complain, you're still going to watch yeah, it. Actually, gonna, I'm going to Because you it. have no principles. It, it doesn't exist. Yeah, I'm going to pretend like so, the Hobbit movies that it doesn't exist. Well, I mean, yeah. I I, I mean, I'm not going to watch it either. But but, but my point in is, general, yeah. still, all of these Lord of the Rings fans are going to watch it and because they're they're serving up the plate of garbage. Yeah. And the people are like, well, I, it's not what I, I prefer. I guess I have but to But I'll eat it, eat it anyway. Instead of, instead of having Christians actually make something that's like, like a hundred proof whiskey, like something that's well, potent and something that's true, you know, we satisfy with the garbage that we're served. And, and a lot of the time, what it comes down to is that sometimes it's easy to underestimate the difficulty of making truly great art, truly great storytelling, truly great music, truly great architecture. These are not easy things. No. You actually have to have people who are true craftsmen and, and true artists in these genres. And even then... And it's hard as a Christian to exist in them. It's still hard. It's very difficult. That's yeah, why there gate, are... Gatekeeping makes that really difficult There as are well. hundreds and hundreds of mediocre and forgettable films for every one or two or five truly great films. Why like is Twilight. That? Have you ever been punched in the jejunum? <laughs> like Twilight. Eric. Why do you keep bringing up Eric Twilight? loves Twilight. <laughs> Have you read Twilight? I've actually never seen nor I've read never, it. I've never seen just, nor read any of it. I gather from a distance it's hyper gay. I only know things about it that people have made fun of. Like, I, I, I think the vampires sparkle. Dumbledore? Whatever. Anyway, so 
when you look at that, it is it, what what Christians often want to do is they want to treat these artistic and media endeavors as sort of taco shells to put a worldview into and just serve to people. Well, Man, like tacos. Can I add to that? Yeah, go ahead. While you're there, it's like they're viewing the movie like a, a cheesy veneer to a gospel tract. Exactly. It's the paper you print it on. However, that's not actually the way that this works. Or good stories in general. Anybody who's ever attempted to create a poem, a story, a song, a piece of art, literature, you know how hard it is. You know how true, like God has to give talent and then you have to cultivate it to a, to a fine edge in the company of other people who will be honest with you about your work and give you, like this is very difficult stuff. And so when, what Christians want to do, I even, when you ask this question, I pulled up the Wikipedia page, Christian media, and it says Christian media, sometimes referred to as inspirational faith and family or simply Christian is a cross media genre <laughs> that features a Christian message or moral. And that is so perfect because what a lot of Christian, you know, quote unquote Christian artistic endeavors are, is they're basically trying to just package some kind of moral story. But it's like trinkety junk. And they treat the medium as packaging. Yeah. That's, that's the problem. You actually can't do that because the media must be excellent and beautiful and done with skill or it won't actually communicate the message you want it to. And so what we need partly is, and, and actually there are, there are people who are doing a good job of recovering some of these things. And it does, you know, another thing is that it takes millions and millions and millions of dollars to make a great film a lot of the time. Not, not all films, but. It takes a lot of money. It really does take a lot of money to do these things. And Christians generally look at the periods of history where the Christians were the one producing the most glorious of everything. It was a time when an all when the bulk of the money in those industries were going to produce those things. Well, when you think about even something like what we do with with podcasting, I've had people ask me, "Well, why don't you have a TV studio like Joe Rogan?" Yeah, we would love to. We you would can love make to. Uh, checks can be made payable. Checks too. made payable. <laughs> but, but I think what you're finding is it, it's the same thing when I started the. Hard well, part. seriously, if you want to give money, we have a Venmo too. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We get a lot of yes. Send your tax deductible. <laughs> contributions to. But I think a big part of it is something that we've we've been hammering on and again I found this out with the Hardman podcast is is look if you want to produce genuinely biblical Christian content, just authentic, yeah. good, celebrating good, true, beautiful, all that good stuff. A you're going to be hated by the culture. Mm -hmm. B even a lot of Christians are willing to support, you know, Netflix or whatever mm -hmm. else. But then when you have guys, you know, going on on a limb and saying like, "Hey, we need to you know, we need to do this this good quality media venture. It, it, it genuinely is hard because we don't have two hundred million dollars, most of us, right, to deal with. And my argument, though, is when you look, okay, um, you had guys behind Walden Media who gave hundreds of millions of dollars to produce Narnia. Yeah. Well, what that tells me, Christian guys, what that tells me is there's money there. But this goes back to things we've talked about in the past. A lot of that money is going to Ben Shapiro. A lot of money is going to the Daily Wire and the celebration of gay marriage. Yeah, and the first thing that they do when you give money to this conservative group is they go and they make, again, they make sometimes excellent, I'm sure, media that is absolutely at war with reality. Yeah. Because they're not Christians. Well, even, even think about... I think it was Daily Wire. They try to make a Western, and, like, Gina Carano is the hero. Oh, yeah, they were just getting, like, canceled actors. Like, butch, like, overly masculine, like, strong feminine woman who's tougher than the guys. They're trying to show, like, look, conservatives are pro-women, too. But they instead, they just continue propping up the narrative of being pro-women by saying women are basically men. Right. Who says I'm gay? You are gay. Again, they're just at war with reality. So you look at you know, the state of Christian media, but, uh, and, and one of the problems is that Christians often want to treat the medium cheaply because they view the medium as sort of unimportant packaging to the message. So to the Christian, they would say, I, if, even if it's super cheesy and poorly made, I want this Christian media to, to go out. And so we're going to, you know, we're going to raise 50 grand and we're going to make a documentary or whatever. It, not understanding that really, truly to make a lot of like the most glorious, Christian art, it's going to take tens of millions of dollars for some of it. 
But then the other thing that, that I think happens is that on the other hand, you get people who notice who are total wolves and not Christians. And they look out and they notice, you know what? There are actually a whole lot of Christians in this country and they all have jobs and money and I want their money. So then they make the lowest common denominator, mega churchianity, mass appeal, Christian Jesus junk, and they Jesus do it to junk. make money. Yes. Yeah, so you see this a lot with musicians, actually. Oh, yeah. With, like, the gospel singers. You had Carrie Underwood, and I, I think Britney Spears even even got her start. What? As a oh, yeah. gospel singer. Celine and then Dion. made no mm-hmm. made the move into, you know, popular culture. The Civil Wars girl. Oh, the singer yeah. Joy yeah, Beth yeah. Williams. Joy Williams started as a Christian artist. Some so, of the more recent yeah. music, not so. Christian. You should go listen to the worship song song by Random Action Verb Band, which is a parody of Christian worship. But it's like you know, I could write a. I guarantee you, I could write a Chris Tomlin song in ten minutes. I, I'll describe the chord progression: G two, uh, D suspended, C two, E minor. D. Every seventh conductor being connected by a non-reversible tremi pipe to the differential girdle spring on the up end of the gram meters. C. You know, and then you just, you sing like things that, you know, God set us on fire. You are our <laughs> desire. Um, your name is holy. Uh, come and fill me. With guacamole. That, with guacamole. You know, you just, and you look at that and you go, compare that to Dawn. Compare that to Paradise Lost. Compare that to some of the Christian poetry that is in our inheritance. And it was not easy to make. Someone labored and spent spent their life and their energy yeah. laboring to create beautiful words to describe this world that God made. Well, because in part they believed that it was a noble task. Yeah. Whereas fundamentally, when you, again, you boil down uh, modern Christianity, the medium doesn't matter. Only the very root of the message, which is, I need to sneak in a gospel presentation yeah, you, you're for decisionism. Uh-huh, exactly. And, there was and actually, so that it do, so it doesn't matter. Why would you spend two hundred million dollars on yeah, a movie yeah. when you just want to tell as many people as possible that Jesus loves you? There was actually a movie yeah. I watched. Uh, I downloaded it last minute while getting on an airplane. It had Robert Duvall, so I thought, oh, it's good. It's like a golf movie. It's like the cheesiest Christian movie of all time. Oh no. This guy, like, you know, he's putting his life back together and, like, it's all, like, small town. You know, it's like a Hallmark movie. Yeah. And then he gets to, like, this golf tournament and, like, the final hole, he goes to hit the <laughs> shot and the movie ends before the, the the ball drops in the hole. And it's like, to find out more, go to da 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 No! And I was like, well, how did it end? It was so a bait and switch? I go to that site and it's like... You're probably wondering how this movie ends. Well, have you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ into your life? Click yes, and we'll show you. And the I end. was like, "Gosh dang it! I want to see the end of this movie." Yeah. And there was no end to the movie. No, oh, that's what? cold. It was disgusting. That's super cold. People was, are converting to Buddhism because that movie. Well, it's the same thing as like the people that leave the tips <laughs> of a hundred dollar bill, million, but it's a uh, fake. It's, it's just like fake. it's, it's like you, you probably thought you just got really rich. Well, you know what'll make you eternally rich? The Lord Jesus Christ. Like, well, you're actually still just poor, just though. Didn't tip. <laughs> Sucks to be you. <laughs> Sucks to be you. Thanks for filling my water up so promptly, though, whenever I drank it all. So here's the other thing. Why are they Southern, Brian? <laughs> I'm assuming. I'm assuming. I'm just assuming. That's very... Bible Belt. You know, That's like very... you, you know, that actually reminds me, speaking of accents, this is like way back to an earlier point, but the whole thing where people think, I'm just going to tell the story objectively, neutrally, Yeah. it's like saying you're going to talk without an accent. You always have an accent. You just think yours is normal. Anyway. I just yeah, that's actually a really Southern. good point. That's a really good point. <laughs> so so always, one of the things, we're talking about Christian media still yeah, yeah, at yeah. this point. One of the articles I've written on the Hard Men podcast, uh, well, it's actually at ericon.com. We'll provide links in the show notes. Shameless plug. Uh, is titled, How the Christian Media Industry is at War with Men. Now, this is interesting mm-hmm. because we've talked about what's chintzy and crappy and all that stuff with Christian media. So we're talking about things like you know, K-Love and passion conferences with Louis Giglio and, you know, a lot of that stuff. But even in the Christian reformed world, you got the Gospel Coalition and you got a lot of stuff in that space, which people like Paul Maxwell, I think, argued well, they're actually at war with Christianity too. Mm. And so uh, one of the things they pointed out, people like Tim Keller recently endorsing a book titled Biblical Critical Theory. Oh. He wrote the foreword to it. Does it is it 
is the subtitle sucks? <laughs> no. Or doesn't exist? It's basically he's trying to show, I think, uh, from reading the uh, sort of the back cover, so to speak, uh, he's trying to jive critical theory with a biblical worldview, uh, which, of course, is ridiculous. You've got Christianity today. They're openly feminist. They just hired an openly feminist woman. I mean, whatever, Russell Moore. <laughs> I repeat myself. Care <laughs> getting us in trouble every time. <laughs> every time. Getting us in trouble. Uh, Once again, direct your emails to eric.theconman at manmail.com. Yeah, but try that. See if it works. <laughs> man man I don't mail? know. I'm just assuming. So if you've got all these Christian- Cardmanmail.com. <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> don't, guys. Don't don't go there. I don't know if it exists. Don't try it. You got all these outlets who are supposed to be pro Christian. Crossway recently talking about the idolatry of motherhood. Right, all pushing a pro-left, <laughs> anti-biblical sexuality, Marxist, open borders, anti-white message. So I think even in, in, in that sector of Christendom, most people feel like, hey, they're at war with us. And mm. you'd actually be right. So I want to close with really a, a question about strategy. Yeah, yeah. And, and the question is, can Christians win? And if so, how? What should our strategy be if we were to take this, this Boniface option— uh, King's Hall approach, and then apply it to media, what would that look like for us? Well, one thing to understand first is that we are in the early days still of this massive, massive technological transformation that has happened. And Christians, and I'm talking about the internet, digital media, all these things. Digital currencies. <laughs> Crypto is king. Uh, Bitcoin. Anyway, cr- historically, Christians have been the ones who have grabbed onto these new technologies. The Bible's the first thing printed on the Gutenberg Press, right? Christian literature explodes through the, through that. Christians in the uh, early medieval times and, and prior are the ones who are preserving the thought of the West in monasteries and, and, and preserving these written works, even of Greeks and Greek philosophy and Roman philosophy and things like that. So, so Christians ought to be looking at this moment where we have these new technologies, and I even mean cutting-edge technologies like now we have artificial intelligence translation, artificial intelligence um, narration, and things like that. Jess Hall, again, the CEO of Canon Press, was talking about this in his talk at the Grace Agenda Men Seminar. We saw and, those pictures, too, even floating around social media, like the AI Kingdom of Heaven pictures. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're stunning. So you see what human ingenuity is is doing. Humans taking dominion and creating culture, yeah. technology, and things like that that can be used for evil, but also they can be used for tremendous good. And so Christians shouldn't be like, oh, you know, the internet, the the the, the social media is that once again with the southern accent, southern accent. Uh, you know, they're 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 the the you and your fancy foosball friends. You know, they're they're of the devil. No, we should actually be saying, how can we how can we go and conquer these mediums? How can we go and make the best podcasts, the best audiobooks, the best films, documentaries, because we're Christians? We need to ban electricity. <laughs> <laughs> then we no one can watch the foosball. But, but what Christians often do is they nar- they artificially narrow and limit the scope of what kind of endeavors they're aiming for. So they say, oh, podcasts. Let's make 50,000 reformed bro theology podcasts, which is really uh, a meta thing for me to say on a reformed bro theology and culture podcast. But you know what else we should be doing? We should be making the best fictional storytelling podcasts. I thought you were going to say music. (laughs) True. We should be making the greatest music. We should be making, you you know, that's, I mean, so like the Theo bro podcast world. Yeah. I actually wouldn't put us there. Uh, because I, I was just being self-deprecating, which is yeah. kind of effeminate. So I'm sorry. Yeah, good. Good. Don't apologize. You didn't do anything wrong, Brian. Real men never Shoot. apologize. I'm getting, I'm getting ho- hoisted <laughs> on my own petard. John Wayne. Oh man, a little Shakespeare. Mm. A petard. Right I don't for know you. That. Yeah, that was hoisted for you, Dan. by his own petard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, but a lot but, of sexual innuendo in Shakespeare, by the way. But go on. Yes, I I I want to ask a question though. Like you look at what's going on in reform circles, and and I wonder too, like. Why are they so bad at culture so many times? And what I mean is, it's like, unless we're talking about theology works Mm -hmm. or like our favorite Baptist preacher, yeah, like we have nothing to say to anything. Think about this. One of the the instincts that has 
suffused certain corners of of reformed Christendom, of reformed Christianity, is a skepticism about adorning and arts. Everything should be well. The beauty. Puritan instinct. Yeah, and and there are there are directions that the Puritans took that it should be drab and where I understand, I absolutely understand the instinct, and I understand the principles they were operating on. I don't want to one dimensionalize them. These were serious men, serious thinkers who built serious Christian culture, and at the same time, I, I think that there were areas where they overreacted to things they were seeing, and ended up, you know, throwing out some of the things that they ought to have actually been you know, creating with excellence, things like beauty and art. So I think that's certainly... It's like an ascetic instinct. Yeah, there's an ascetic instinct in, in in Christian faith. You know, but one of the things that I think might be driving it to be charitable is that Christians think we live in serious times where people are dying and going to hell. And we have the gospel of the kingdom of God. So why wouldn't we make everything we do be just 100% completely transparently about that. And and anything we do, what it should drive always to a gospel presentation and altar call. Okay, there's a way, like I get the thought process that leads you there, but what you end up doing because you're operating on a, on a, on a, on a, a thin anthropology, you're failing to recognize that human beings are not brains on a stick. Human beings are not just USB drives that you plug into a hard drive, give a gospel presentation. Human beings are embodied souls within the world. They have all these senses that God has given them and all of these, this beauty and sounds and tastes and smells and stories and longings and hopes. They're supposed to be, as Lewis described, like sunbeams coming through a hole in the garden shed that makes you want to put your eye to that hole and follow the light up to the sun. God is the creator of all good things. And so I think Christians can sometimes um, be too quick to try and sum up everything in gospel presentation and, and bald theology and fail to recognize that one of the most powerful ways to, to actually teach theology and to evangelize the world is through indirect means and through beauty and through the shaping of the hopes and longings of people. In the same way, God could have just revealed himself, kind of like a, um, a bad sci-fi book. Mm. Where the where the guy he does world building and he's like here's a rock planet it's all rock and there's just crustaceans and there's a storm that goes around it and that's the that's the world yeah really boring and uninteresting mm -hmm. right but God didn't make a world like that nor are people yeah. like that you talking about where, Brandon Sanderson I did uh, yeah, <laughs> oh, I wow just, okay I, all right uh, storm like uh, uh, actually the world building was more interesting but he fundamentally yeah. believes a lie. He's Mormon, yeah. Yeah, he 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 believes a lie that he made a um, Mormon universe. That this world isn't that interesting, so he had to make a lie. But anyway, we can get into that in a different different episode. Yeah. But the point is, people aren't like that either. People aren't just like a one dimensional. So we live on like a. There's actually like this spiritual plane, and that's all that we mm -hmm. all that we are. I mean, none of the none of these uh, Theo Bros that you know we're just throwing in like a buck them in a bucket live like that either. They don't just the, their entertainment isn't like well I I I'm just going to read Jonathan Edwards, that's my entertainment. No, these guys watch The Office. Like they go to work. They they like other things like cigars and I don't know what else they like. Right. But but they're more complex than that too. To where a story shouldn't just always dive down into the one thing, and that's a gospel presentation for decisionism because we found also that that's not effective because that's not how good God designed. Actually, uh, the winning of men's hearts no. wasn't through just like, oh, here's a, here's a uh, thesis, you know, here's your problem, here's the solution, yes. make a decision. Two propositions and a conclusion. Correct. I'm, right. I'm pretty sure I mentioned this before, but somewhere Peter Lightheart has an article about this where like a lot of Protestant evangelicals in the way they make movies is very conversionistic. Yeah. Like everything's bad, you get saved, everything's good. Right. And it tended to be that Scorsese and others, Catholics, were the ones who understood the sanctification that, like, a Christian could have a real depth of depravity. The complexity. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of complexity and a lot of layering. So I think that's a huge part of it. So I think we'll close with this. We, we really have a couple strategies, I think, yeah. when it comes to how do we engage with media. Number one is that we fundamentally, we just abandon the institutions or we recapture them. Yeah. I think there's... You know, that's that's one strategy. You can either go one one of two ways on that. Mm -hmm. I think in the short term, 
that recapturing, say, like the New York Times is not going to happen. No. Not going to happen. No. Well, like, Andy Wilson has a show on Netflix. Right. Yeah. Hello, Ninja. Hello, Ninja. That's right. I think you can... We almost have to do what Marcuse was doing in the 70s, which is a long, slow march through the institutions. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. you're going to have to infiltrate and be subtle and, and do those things. I think people should be doing that. Yeah, so so I know you're summarizing, but with uh, Hello, Ninja, it's very subtle. It's mm -hmm. very subtle. But there yeah. are things like the boy character won't allow the girl character to go into battle. He's like always taking the lead. Mm. That's the subtle. That's the yeah, subtle thing. Yeah. Because if he was, uh, anyway. So that's, yeah, the subtlety. Slow march. So you just get your finger, you know, in there. Yeah, and it's helpful. I don't think anyone is necessarily like, you have to take this one. Mm -hmm. uh, strategy number two, uh, this is the Torba, I think a little bit of lore TV, Canon Press, yeah. which is that you build adjacent or parallel media. Yeah. Right? Canon Press, you've mentioned them. Um, they've done a really good job of building media where it's like, you know, I have uh, pretty much can consume on the Canon Press app kind of all day long. Yep. Um, Listen to it, books, podcasts. It's pretty much all edifying. Yep. Um, and you're going to find a lot of good content there. Yeah. Uh, I haven't dabbled as much with Lore TV. Brian, I know. I've been on there. Yeah, I watched a little bit of Dark Holler. Um, some of them I ended up uh, like skipping through a few of the episodes and things like that. Dark Holler, there's another one, the, the Post Mill documentary that they make. I love the concept of what they're aiming for, though. I love the idea of building a platform that's unapologetically Christians being Christians, but also making, like, I think it was pretty cool that one of the first things they did was make a paranormal adjacent show, which is not what you'd think a Christian would be doing, but understanding that actually the popularity of the paranormal genre shows the spirit, like the innate spirituality of the world and of man. And so absolutely Christians should go in there and say, we actually know what's happening in this world. Yeah. And we know like when you see old aunt Muriel's ghost, I'm sorry, it's a demon and we can explain it to you. Like we should be the ones who are providing the substance in some of these 14 genres without being um, overly obsessed with demons. Yeah. So I, I think honestly, I, I think a lot of Christianity, like we're sort of in our infancy with that stuff. Yeah. That would be, uh, you know, my estimation of it. Gab is another one. Uh, huge, powerful, but yeah. like we're kind of all finding out. Like, if you want to start your own banking network and your own platform, Andrew Torba doing great work, but you're kind of starting from zero. You're like 15 years behind Facebook, and so mm -hmm. very difficult. It, it's a challenge. Yeah, it's very a real difficult. challenge. There's a reason Facebook has an army of hundreds and possibly thousands of software engineers coding their system because people don't understand how uh, immensely complex it is to make something like a social media platform that's available across the world to tens of millions of people simultaneously. Well, even, Very difficult. Even hundreds in of Salt, Lake, of millions. Salt yeah. Lake City, uh, there's a Facebook building here. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew a gal who was worked at the, whatever it is, Salt Lake Power and Light or whatever, mm -hmm. um, and she spent two years putting in an extra power grid for Facebook. And it's just a power grid for one of their buildings. Yes. So when so, you look at what Torba and Gab is doing, Yes. Opening server rooms because they're they're they are one hundred percent doing their thing. Think from about the, the scale. Up. Think about the scale. Absolutely Chad King impressive what they're doing, to be honest. When you look at the fact that for ninety nine point nine percent of Christian entrepreneurs would have been done when Amazon shut their servers off. And instead they said, We're gonna build our own freaking servers. <laughs> and then they did it. Like, I don't know, I think that's pretty wildly that's pretty impressive. That's pretty amazing. We need Christians with that kind of, like, if you're going to go do these sorts of things, you have to understand you're going to face rampant opposition. Go look at the tomato. What What is it? Rotten Tomatoes? Yeah. Go look at the reviews, the critic reviews from movies that are made by Christians that are actually really good. I can't think of one, but I know they exist. Like, movies that tell stories about natural families We've and things like that. And then they'll have 20% critic reviews, 98% audience reviews. Like you have to understand, you're going to be at war with the entire industry with if you the go do these things. Yeah, with even, the gatekeepers, the priests. Even think about people like Mel Gibson. Mm -hmm. His films do really well. Oh, yeah. And he is absolutely hated, hated by the establishment. Yeah, absolutely. So, even Torba faces death threats regularly. Yeah. Like, can't freely go out in public all the time. Because people are trying to kill him. Yeah, they hate him that bad because he's making a like when they say go make your own social media platform if you don't like it. Well, if you actually do it, they'll try to kill you. Yeah, you you have to 
you kind of have to realize that. Like the, yeah, the uh, stakes I, are high. Guys, by the way, I would totally not be surprised if one day they kicked us off all the stuff. Kings Hall. Well, that, that kinda, I'm actually surprised that yeah, they haven't. Right, Hearth. We're not. That actually brings me to the third yeah. strategy. Uh huh. Because I think Ooh, this is third. probably where we are right now. Guys, by the way, there's only two strategies written down in our notes. So we're but about I'm on to the hear, third. We're about to hear Eric <laughs> I'm on hot the third. Take. going off the reservation. Hot Here take. we go. Third strategy, work within the system with tools available to get our message out. Mm. I actually think we're sort of straddling. So, you know, we're on Gab. We have some good relationships there. Yeah. With the Gab people. Yeah, we the, love the, them. The, the Gabbers. They're amazing. But I think what we've also done is said, like, you know, and I know a lot of people have disagreed with this. We're on, like, you know, LGBT homo supporting uh, platforms. Oh, yeah, yeah. We use tools that are built by pagans. All over the web. I Absolutely. like the way you said it better than the way that Eric. Well, said it. but we repeat ourselves. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. that's what the pagans are doing. That's their. That's their. You religion. actually liked Brian's better. I well, yeah, thought, yeah. We're on the pagans platforms versus like it sounded like we're directly supporting the gays. Oh, I'm not supporting them. It's like this: you you can't avoid. You have to understand that when you spend a dollar, it is inevitable that you're supporting sodomy somewhere. I mean, I don't care what you're buying. It's almost impossible for you to remove yourself from the chain of injustices somewhere where you're, the world is so tainted by sin that whatever you buy, even if you buy the unlocked Android phone that you're going to put your Linux system on and run Gab only or something like that, which is great, good good, good for you, go do that. You're still going to buy software chips that are made by pagans that are going to support sodomy somewhere. It, we, we don't win by attempting to remain pure and in, in this completely separated state. Yeah, like an I think, Anabaptist is what you're saying? We do not win yeah. by Anabaptism. I think it's being cognizant of that fact that, it, 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 you know, there's going to be, in the marketplace, there's going to be meat sacrificed to idols. Eat anything in the meat market I went without questions this, of conscience, Paul said. I went through this whole shtick where I was like, no, I reject Apple. I'm only using Samsung. Yeah. And then my dad, who was <laughs> a Samsung check. user, yeah. he was like, have you read the history of yeah, Samsung? Y- y- you do know that they're just communists <laughs> too. Like, like, they're all... It's not better. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and and I know people disagree, but on on some of those things, and and we have as well with other people. But I think fundamentally, the whole point of this show, if if we could distill it down to one thing, is look, Christians need to be thinking about leveraging. Sometimes it's going to be for guerrilla tactics. Sometimes yeah. it's going to be all at warfare. We need to be thinking about how we use media. Mm-hmm. I think that we there's a lot of people that need to be making the long slow march through the institutions. Yeah. Uh, we've got Christians in the FBI. We've got Christians in the New York Times. Yeah. And we do need them there. Yeah. we, we And we need parallel outlets, too. We want to be strategic. Yes. We want to be strategic. We want to operate as if they should be scared of us, not the other way around. Too often, Christians operate as if we should be so scared of them. Well, this is what Chuck, like, Chuck Knox said, right? The gospel yeah. is the contagion. Yeah, like, we're going to get the cooties on us. No, no, no. No, no, no. They're going to get our cooties on them. Yeah, I mean, let me come up with something better. <laughs> They're going to get the contagion of the gospel is going to infect, and it is going to spread like leaven th- till it's all leavened. That's what Jesus says the gospel of the kingdom is like, right. or the kingdom of God is like. So be crafty as serpents and innocent, innocent as, as doves. doves. So, so Paul wrote, greet those in Caesar's household. Think about that. Caesar's household. Think about John the Baptist giving Who advice was, to the by, tax by, collectors and the soldiers. Nero. By the way, Dan, you're doing church history. Who was Caesar at that time? Yeah, it was Nero. Nero. It was Nero. So when Paul's writing that in the household of Caesar, there were yeah. Christians in Nero's house. In which the is beast wh- of Revelation's house. Which is why I have no qualms about Christians going and teaching in public schools subversively as long as their kids aren't in them. Because it's a different ballgame. Different ballgame. Like, which is why for us, strategically, we're going to pick certain things, you know, to the, especially as it's local to me and I have opportunity, I'm going to bless Christians doing Christian things, even if it costs me a little bit more, et cetera, when they're doing a good job, I'm going to say, yeah. And I'm also, without shame, going to use an Apple phone or computer or whatnot, and I'm not going to be scared of that because I'm going to use those tools. I'm going to take that tool and I'm going to use it to publish to the world the most app, the content they are absolutely terrified of. So terrified of that they try to cancel it everywhere they get. Every gatekeeper is intent on keeping us out. And we're like, we're there, baby. It's like buying we're a there. sword from the enemy and then using it. And then it. stabbing it. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, censors, we're actually not promoting violence. Spiritually, of course. Spiritually. Yeah, the sword that comes from his mouth. Metaphorically speaking. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, so I think summing it up, Christian arts and media is a me- our mediums by which we tell the truth. Yeah, we tell the truth about what the world is like, where it's gone wrong, and what the only thing that will change it, and and wherein we aim to win the whole person, understanding who they are, how God created them, and also the means by which God is appointed for people to be influenced, which is more than the mere transfer of information. It's also the capturing of people's hearts through beauty and also through properly showing ugliness. And so Christians ought to be in the business of excellently invading and creating media to the glory of God, not just in these Christian ghettos, but in every aspect of what it means to be human. I think that's a phenomenal place to end. In the words of Brian Sauvé, that was glorious. Ooh, I like it. You know what, Eric? In the words of Eric, not a Jew. (laughs) <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> That's you. huge. That's huge, Eric. Not a Jew. And I would also say we'd like to give a special shout out to our sponsors, Christendom Bible College and Reformation Heritage Books. We appreciate them. A lot of sales running on Reformation Heritage Books. Yeah. Right now they had a sale on the Puritans. Mm-hmm. So definitely check that out, heritagebooks.org. Check that in the show notes and be sure to support them. They're supporting us and we really appreciate that. Until next time, gentlemen, Festinalente. Make haste slowly. Amen.